what up Cavs Nation? I'm your host Ethan Sands and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. We're post game three so you know we have the perfect crew to analyze all the things going on after game three of this series between the Orlando Magic and the Cleveland Cavaliers. I got Chris Fedor, Jimmy Watkins, let's get into it. First and foremost, <laughs> bad, ugly, disappointing. The three words that came to my mind while watching this game, Chris and Jimmy, because the worst loss in franchise playoff history for the Cleveland Cavaliers are the only words to describe this game and how it panned out. I mean, the Cavs were losing by 40 at one point. They ended up losing by 38. Chris, you were in the arena, and we're going to get to the stats and all of those things, but what were your emotions and feelings of what you saw with everybody in Kia Center tonight? 43, not 40. Let's not shortchange the magic, those three points when they were leading. Um, Look, I mean, to me, my big takeaway was that the many, many questions that people have about the Cavs, the many flaws that this roster, that this team does have, all of those were unmasked on one terrible night. But it's one game. Nobody predicted the Cavs to sweep the Magic. Um, No team is going to go undefeated in a postseason run. It was horrendous. I totally understand the frustration. I totally understand the anger. I totally understand the disappointment. Everybody inside the organization should have those same feelings, and they did. Um, It was just start to finish, top to bottom, offense, defense. It was as bad of a a basketball game that the Cavs could play, and they picked the wrong time for it. I mean, we knew not to overreact to games one and two, but I think this is a time not to overreact to game three, maybe even more, because we knew that the Cavs needed to score 100 points to be competitive, not only in this series, but in the postseason as a whole. But to score 83 points (laughs) on the opposing team's floor, it looked like these teams kind of flip-flopped, and then the Orlando Magic just put on the gauntlet. (laughs) Put the foot down a little bit harder than the Cavs did when they were at home. Jimmy, what was your initial reaction to this game? I think think it's an immature loss because I think it's fair. It was fair for us to expect Orlando to have more juice at the beginning of the game. 100%. We all should have seen that coming, including the Cavs. And, And there's nothing they can really do about that, right? Because... As much as they can say as they did at practice yesterday that they have to come out with the same desperation that Orlando has, that's impossible because they're not down 0-2 fighting for their season, right? However, once you recognize that, you see that they have that first little burst, whatever, when I would, I would call it probably when Mitchell first went to the bench and it went from a three-point uh, deficit to, I think, a 12-point deficit when he checked back in. That's where you got to make the adjustment and try to match meet Orlando where they're at. And they just never did, man. It got worse and worse and worse and worse and ugly and non-competitive. And, like, J.B. Bickerstaff's basically punting on the game in the third quarter. Like, it's it's embarrassing. And it's, it's like, again, like Ethan said, I don't know that we should overreact to it. No. (laughs) I don't know that we should underreact to it, though, because... (laughs) Like, this is the kind of loss that better wake you up. And it's sounding all these kinds of alarm bells. And there are, you know, an- anomalous things about this game. Like, are the Orlando Magic going to shoot darn near 40% from three again again in this series? I don't think so. But we also have things that are that are trends now. The Cavs aren't making shots. They're having trouble getting – they're having trouble scoring. This is this – is, these, are, these are things that – have been persistent problems that that can't that they haven't corrected now. So we're, we we got to find a, a happy ground, uh, a happy middle ground for distress here. Yeah. So that's the thing about yeah. And I mean, series. we've talked all season. 
Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. No, I mean, that's the thing about playoff series, right? Um, they are an emotional roller coaster. When a team is winning the first two games, when a team is ahead in a series, when a team is doing things well enough to get wins, it feels like they can't lose. And then that same team turns around and loses, and then it feels like, well, there's no path for them to win again, right? So I do think it's just about reacting to what happened tonight in Game 3, pointing out the flaws, um, talking about the things that they can fix moving forward. But one of the hardest things to do when it comes to a playoff series is trying to keep the emotions from overtaking all of your potential analysis. And I know we talked about before this playoff series that Donovan Mitchell was going to try and shoulder as much of the burden as he possibly could. In the first two games, he wanted to start and spark the games, and he came out and did that. And in today's game, one, he did not do that to any extent. But two, he also looked to have re-aggravated his knee injury, which could play a factor later into this series. And Chris, I know you talked about this a little bit in your post-game story, and I know everybody's been saying that Donovan Mitchell says he keeps taking on himself. And he had 13 points tonight on 6 of 16 shooting. There were only two other players on the Cavaliers to shoot 10 or more shots. <laughs> when is it going to be time for him to kind of point to everybody else and say, like, I know I'm the leader of this team, I know I'm the star of this team, but I cannot do it without everybody else? I just think when it comes to Donovan, guys, he's got to, he's got to do what he thinks is best for him and the team based on how the Magic are going to go about defending the Cavs. And you mentioned it, Ethan. He had been trying to set the tone in the first quarter, trying to get this team off to good starts. In the first two games, he did that by scoring the basketball. Now, tonight he didn't get that opportunity. Number one, the Magic made a change. They put Jalen Suggs on him instead of Gary Harris. That was different. I think the, the Magic felt like after the first two games, Gary Harris is going to be good enough, potentially defensively, to disrupt Darius Garland in the state that Darius is in with the way that he is currently playing. Um, so let's try and just be physical with Darius off the ball, on the ball. Use Gary Harris, who, you know, is accomplished defensive player throughout the course of his career. But let's try Jalen Suggs on Donovan Mitchell. Let's throw a curveball. And beyond that, they took Jonathan Isaac out of the starting lineup and they put Wendell Carter Jr. in. That changed their defensive scheme a little bit, too. And they sent two guys to the ball to try and force Donovan into being more of a playmaker, into being more of an initiator, creator for his teammates. And they tried to get the ball out of his hands. Now, Donovan had five assists in the first quarter, but the Cavs are at their best like when Donovan is going supernova. That just gives them a jolt. Right? It gives them a level of confidence. And it felt like because Orlando took the ball out of his hands, because they forced him to be a playmaker as opposed to a scorer, um, it kind of disrupted the Cavs' offensive flow. And, and nobody was willing to step up and shoulder that level of offensive re responsibility from a scoring standpoint. Um, so that's something that the Cavs are going to have to look at going into Game 4. But you got to give Jamal Mosley credit for that. You got to give Jalen Suggs credit for the way that he just harassed Donovan, the way that he was physical with him, tried to stay in front of him. Um, and now it's something that the Cavs have to figure out and, and try and counter. Yeah, and I mean, we talk about Donovan's scoring being a factor. He scored seven of his nine first half points in the closing minutes of the first half. Yeah. And then scored four points in the remainder of the game. So that just shows, one, how Jalen Suggs is as a defender and how we've talked about him as an all-defensive team, second-team level player for the series and for the regular season, and he deserves that recognition and how he's disrupted the offense for the Cavs. And, I mean, it's something that 
you don't see regular players come back from a knee strain mm-hmm. in, the, in the first half and then come back to impact the second half of game two and then take over in game three. I mean, he had 24 points. He wasn't hitting shots in the first two games and then came back and just started flashing from three in this third game. So, Jimmy, I want to look a little bit at what Jalen Suggs' impact did for the Cavs, looking at how he guarded Darius Garland in the first two games, switching to Donovan in the third game, but also scoring and what he's meant for that Orlando squad. Suggs is legit, man. Um, he's he's a tough kid, clearly, about the way he bounced back from that injury. Um, if he's making shots like, the, like he was to, I mean, he's not going to go 9 for 11 the rest of the series, but if he's making shots at a level anywhere close to this for the rest of the series, it can really change the series. I'm I'm just thinking more about what Chris was saying about about the way they're guarding Donovan, like Suggs Suggs up to the, being up to the task guarding Donovan. We'll see about Donovan's knee, and, and really if, if Orlando is going to defend Donovan as aggressively as they did tonight, if they're going to just say, basically, we don't think the rest of your rest of your teammates are good enough to beat us four on three. I mean, <laughs> that's. The Cavs have to – that's what every – like at a certain point, if you're, you have to start looking beyond this series a little bit in big picture. That's what this playoff run is about, right? Like this is, this is one game. We need to take it as one game. It's an alarming one game, and we can try to learn and grow from it and try to – we'll get to this later in the pot. I think it's a good chance, maybe the first chance for the Cavs to actually show how, how well they learned how to take a punch last postseason. But big picture, man – the the offense cannot be cut off as abruptly as it was when the, when Orlando decides to put two two on the ball like that man like that that's supposed to that's supposed to be play into the offense's hands and it's not like like the the Cavs would tell you in in an abstract conversation they would tell you that their team is built for this they are built to be able to to withstand a team that wants to take the ball out of Donovan Mitchell's hands you know they they feel really good about how. Evan Mobley and Jared Allen play in the big-to-big passing game. Jared Allen had some nice moments in the beginning of this game, scoring in the mid, scoring with his little floaters when they were getting the ball out of Donovan's hands. Darius Garland, against in a in a one-on-one matchup, I think the Cavs would tell you in an abstract conversation they'd feel really good about that. To, I, I, you do have to give D- Gary Harris credit for the way he defended Darius, and we do have to mention the fact that Darius is dealing with his back still. But the Cavs are saying it's the playoffs. He's fine, so we also have to be holding him to the, to to a standard right. <laughs> that's better than two for ten for five points. I'm not I'm not saying that he has to be, you know, a hundred and sixty million dollar max guy because we know he's not healthy right now. But you got to be better than that. You yeah. got to be better than that. And and beyond that, Max Struess and George Niang, like, you got to make shots. We've been praising. We've spent a lot of time praising them for the other stuff they're doing in this series so far and that is all well and good like Max Struess has been very impressive on the glass George Niang has been I think like I think he's caught the magic off guard a little bit with how well he's held up defensively in this series but like you got paid the money to make shots you have to make shots yeah and I think that's where we shift this conversation to the toughness aspect of it and how things have to pan out going forward. And I want to start with what you said about Max Struess' rebounds, and you're absolutely correct. In the first two games, he was a menace on the boards. But tonight, he had just one rebound. And I think now, because they entered the game 2 of 18, I believe it was, from three-point range, and now they're just quick math, quick math, (laughs) Three of 24, and the only three-pointer that they had tonight between George Niang and Max Struess was from George. And like you said, I mean, they get paid to make shots. Obviously, what they bring to all the other aspects of the game are good and dandy, but they need to knock down shots, especially if they're going to put two on the ball, like you said, Jimmy. And then that also moves over to Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. We have talked all series about how Jared Allen and Evan Mobley have played so well defensively and have 
stop points in the paint, and things of that nature. Tonight, <laughs> Paolo Bancaro was a menace. And he was hitting turnaround jumpers, mid-range, step-back, faders. Like, there were so many different moves that he was pulling out of his bag. And it just looked like he regained a different level of confidence that he had when they were in Cleveland. And, Chris, I know you touched on the toughness aspect of it in your post-game gamer. So I want to get your ideas of what happened for them in the toughness department especially from Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, who were held without double-digit rebounds for both of them. To me, guys, this was the most bothersome aspect of tonight's game, if from a Cavs perspective. Um, there are legitimate questions about this team, its toughness, its mental toughness. It is abundantly clear that teams around the NBA think that the Cavs are a bunch of sissies. They talk to them constantly. <laughs> They jaw with them. They celebrate in their face. Franz Wagner called Marcus Morris Sr. an a-hole. Jalen Suggs basically, like, danced in the face of the Cavs bench and was talking smack with Tristan Thompson basically the entire game. Um, Paolo Bancaro did the too small after scoring on Donovan Mitchell. So it's like, yeah, the Magic are mouthy, and they're probably mouthier than they should be for a team that's losing a series two games to one, but it's up to the Cavs to shut them up and do something about it. And I'm not talking about throwing a guy into the stanchion. I'm not talking about a flagrant two. I'm not talking about an ejection. It's just, like, have some toughness. Have some pride. Show some effort. Like, match their level of physicality. Match their level of intensity. For, for the Cavs to give up 14 offensive rebounds... Mm. Paulo Bancaro had seven on his own. Um, that led to 22 second chance points for Orlando. That was a concern that people had coming into the series. It didn't show up in the first two games. A lot of that is being out of position. A lot of that is effort. A lot of that is toughness. Um, Wendell Carter Jr. is different than Jonathan Isaac, right? He's more physical. He's bulkier. He's not as wiry. He's actually a center, whereas Jonathan Isaac was a four that was forced to play center based on how the Magic wanted to construct their lineup. But, like, are you going to let Wendell Carter Jr. throw you around? Like, really? You're going to let him hit you and, and take you out of position when you're battling on the glass? Really? Wendell Carter Jr.? He's not Mitchell Robinson. That's not Julius Randle. That's not Joel Embiid. So I just felt from a Cavs perspective, for all of the people that wonder about their maturity, their readiness, their mental toughness, their physicality, their toughness in general, um, for those people that question it, the Cavs gave them more reasons tonight to do so. Yeah, I think that's what I was talking about with the immaturity point I was making earlier like it's one thing if your offense gets stuck in the mud on the road against a really good defense they make some they shoot an uncharacteristic uncharacteristic percentage from three-point range like I could digest a loss like that I could even digest you know a 20-point loss like that like I could, that's these things that whatever they happen randomness right but like I, I really thought that these were the these are, this is the kind of loss that the Cavs should have left behind them last right. year particularly when the matchup is, we've, we've seen the matchup be favorable to them. We've seen Jared Allen look like freaking Bill Russell mm -hmm. at Rocket Mortgage. And like, because, because the venue changes, the identity of the game changes. Like it, it should, that's, that's what's supposed to happen to a team like Orlando, where half of the roster is making its first playoff appearance. That's not what's supposed to happen to a team that is, it, like pushing its chips closer and closer to the table every off season, and trying to like try, trying like the Cavs are trying to convince Donovan Mitchell that they are contenders, <laughs> and they are they are trying to tell everyone else that that last year was just a bad matchup, and we've learned so much right. from it, and so on and so forth. Well, tonight it doesn't look like it. Again, one game, but it didn't look like it. 
I mean, I think the biggest thing for me tonight is that Evan Mobley came away with two rebounds. Two. Both on the defensive end. Like, Jared Allen had eight. He had three offensive rebounds. Sure. So they combined for 10 rebounds. Paolo Bancaro had 14 rebounds by himself. Yeah. <laughs> Seven on each end of the floor. Like, that, that is toughness personified. And Paolo, somebody who is just getting his feet wet in the playoffs, who is not used to this scenery, not supposed to be used to the physicality that the playoffs bring, and something that... Jared Allen said that they felt like they had grown in department-wise since last season. Did not show that in today's game. And it was something that stood out to me because you saw it. As soon as Tristan Thompson checked in the game, he checked somebody. (laughs) I really don't think it mattered who was going to be on the other end of it, but he was going to check somebody. And obviously at that point it was too late, but... That's just, like, the mentality that I think I was looking for more so. Like you said, Chris, not so much as hitting somebody, but just setting a tone, setting a mentality, setting a mindset that you're not going to get pushed around, especially in a playoff game when you're up 2-0. And Karis LeVert said at practice on Wednesday, they were expecting Orlando to come out and play with a level of desperation. I don't think winning by 38 calls for desperation at all from this Orlando Magic team. Yeah, I think the other thing is... It, it's the other thing one I'd thing. say about Paolo... Go ahead. That's, the other thing I would say about Paolo is that he looked real comfortable tonight, man. That This oh, is the yeah. Paolo... This is the Paolo that I, would, I was worried about at the start of this series. Like, this is the kind of guy that, you know, you can coax him into the type of shots you want him to take. He can make them. And if, the, if this is... My worry going forward would be this is the kind of game that carries over for a guy like Paolo. When when a star catches a rhythm like this, it can have legs. And if Paolo, if if you're going to see more of this kind of Paolo going forward, it doesn't always matter who you have on him. He's, I mean, it, it's not like again, Paolo. Honestly, Paolo could have been, like the worst case scenario is he gets to the rim right tonight. He's taking the shots you want him to take a lot of the time, and they're, he's just making them. I mean, he took 26 shots. That's the combined amount of Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell. He took, he took, game. He took 13 in the first quarter. In the first That's, quarter. I, I, that maybe, maybe there's something else in there, but like to your point about, about, about Garland, like, that's how you want. Like, if, if Paolo said, basically, if I'm going out, I'm going out that's swinging, right. man. Like, and that's that's how you want guys like that to behave. And again, we I can't I I want to color this by saying we we can't know how well or not well Darius is doing physically. But like, you need a little bit more verve. You need a little bit more stick your nose in there in these moments. Go yeah, ahead, you Chris. could tell that that you could tell that Paulo sensed the moment, um, and there was urgency to the way that he played, and it was a do or die situation. And he wasn't turning it toward Jalen Suggs, right? He wasn't turning it toward Wendell Carter Jr. He was basically saying, I got to go out. I've got to be aggressive. I got to go out. I've got to attack this defense. There's been a lot of conversation about my turnovers. That There's been a lot of conversation about Evan Mobley and the way that he's defended me. All right, I'm just going to put my head down. I'm going to do all of the things that I know that I can do. I'm going to do all the things for this team that I did during the regular season. And I, I think I think the other thing that we have to point out is that the Magic were at home. This is one of the best home teams in the entire NBA. Young dudes play better at home. Young dudes feed off the crowd. They're just more comfortable. They don't get caught up in the emotions of a playoff environment on the road, which can be really, really hostile, really, really challenging, can rattle you a little bit. 29 and 12 at home during the regular season. Um, and young players have a tendency to, to feed off of that and look more comfortable, look more calm, look more poised, look more at peace. And and that's that's what Paolo looked like. That's what Franz Wagner looked like. That's what Jalen Suggs looked like tonight. 
and I, I read an article on Palo Bancaro that came out from one of my friends that just had his first byline drop in ESPN. And I was like, this is coming before game three down 2-0. I was like, is this really the best time to be dropping this article? <laughs> and now I'm like, if he doesn't hit the bump button on this story, <laughs> like, because he's Palo Bancaro is called the franchise. He yep. is the Donovan Mitchell to the Cleveland Cavaliers of the Orlando Magic. Like, he is the guy that they build around. He's the guy that they went and got to make sure that they have success in the postseason. That's how you show it. 31 points, 14 rebounds. It's insane to think in his first playoff appearance that he's having this kind of thing. Like, sure, he's had two games under his belt, and he's been able to do these things all year long, and he had 40-plus points against the Cavs in the regular season. So it's not something that we haven't seen from Paolo, but, like, just him being able to rise to the moment, I, like Chris said, I think that's something that we need to take account of and try and see what's going to happen for the rest of the series because, like Jimmy said, that looked like something that he could carry on, especially in the game floor, game four when they're still at home. But I think the one thing that the Cavs did that – wasn't horrible that they had been struggling with for the remain for the other part of the series was <laughs> was turning the ball over like they only had um five turnovers from the starting lineup obviously they didn't play in the fourth quarter so that kind of helps them but I, I mean just looking at how they were able to not turn the ball over even though they took 10 less shots then the Orlando Magic might be a positive to take away from this uh, game. But, Chris, what do you think? Am I just picking at straws over here? Yeah, I think you are. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I, I think even though the turnovers didn't happen, there was a level of discomfort that the Cavs felt on the offensive end of the floor. And, and I think there's been a relative level of discomfort that they felt on the offensive end of the floor in this entire series. And we talked about it following game two. Like, we talked about all the flaws that we were seeing even mixed into the wins, right? They were one of the worst offenses by, by rating in, in the postseason. Um, they were one of the worst three-point shooting teams by percentage in the postseason. And that was even in spite of two victories because they were able to lean on their defense. That was one of the like troubling aspects too of tonight is that, you know, I, I think a lot of people understand that this magic defense is really good and the Cavs offense isn't the most dynamic offense in the world. Right. But the defense was supposed to be the backbone for this team. The defense was supposed to allow, you know, bad shooting nights to not, um, spiral out of control. The defense was supposed to allow the Cavs to stay competitive in these games during the playoffs, even when Donovan Mitchell um, looks uncomfortable and isn't um, putting up the, 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 the point total that he's probably used to and having the impact on the game that, that he's used to. For the Cavs to give up 121 points to the Orlando Magic... Uh, the worst offense, statistically, of any team that made the playoffs. <sighs> I mean, they had three quarters of at least 30 points. Mm. This is supposed to be a defensive-minded team. This is a defense-first team. And yes, defenses have bad nights, just like offenses have bad nights. But their effort on the defensive end of the floor, their communication on the defensive end of the floor... Their attention to detail and sticking with the scouting report and all those different things, that just wasn't there at the level that it was in the first two games. And yes, there are some outlier things. And Paolo hit some tough shots. And he made four threes. And the odds of him making four threes in game four are very, very low. Um, the Magic as a whole made 13 threes as a team. They were plus 15 from three-point range. So yeah, there's always going to be outlier type things within a game, within a playoff series. But the effort, the things that the Cavs can actually control, 
Like, that just wasn't there to the level that it needed to be for a playoff game tonight, especially on defense. And, and Jimmy, I want to let you get into this, but I want to point out, like, what Chris said. (laughs) The Cavs allowed the Orlando Magic to score 121 points. Over the first two games, the Magic scored 169 points. Yeah. In total. That's here's here, here's another thing that brings it home. <laughs> Think about this. It, in the first two games in Cleveland, the Magic through three quarters were averaging 61.5 points. Okay, that's through three quarters. They scored 61 in the first half. Jimmy, I, I'm going to let you go because you clearly got a lot to say about this. I mean, it's gut check time, man. Like, I really think as as much momentum as the Cavs built during those first two games, like, the, the pressure pendulum has completely swung at this point. Um, if for North, like, Orlando is, like, kind of playing with house money here, right? Like, 47-win season is already a great accomplishment for them. And, you know, Mosley's a, a finalist for Coach of the Year because I think everyone recognizes they are ahead of schedule here. The Cavs have some, like, big-picture questions to answer during this postseason run. So the second that they and they, they are faced with adversity, now we're all looking at you. Spotlight's mm-hmm. on you, man. Like, you, if you, like, too many, too many more performances like that, and we're talking about like sweeping changes again one game but i think this is I, I hinted at it earlier i really think this is the first chance that we are even sn- like sniffing the same level of how testing their playoff readiness than that we saw last year the first two games it's great that they responded it's great that they improved upon their physicality. It's great that they controlled the glass. It's great that they played defense. Well, now, now someone else punched you in the mouth. What happens now? What happens? Yeah, and I think that's where I wanted to go next was the response portion of it because mm-hmm. this is something that the Cavs haven't felt in this series yet. And obviously we want to look big picture here for the Cavs. Like, there's a lot riding on this first-round series. There's a lot riding on the next round because of what Donovan Mitchell has in mind for success of this season and some other players on this team as well. And, I mean, Jimmy, you mentioned it. In the first two games, the Cavs responded in different ways to the Orlando Magic's different runs. J.U. Bickerstaff was able to make adjustments that we had said that were better than last year. But, Chris, I want to get your overarching perspective long-term, what you're seeing right now, what needs to improve, but how this team needs to respond for Game 4. First of all, I'll say this. Being in the locker room, there is still a ton of confidence. Um, One player even said, we're going back home 3-1. So there is a belief in that locker room um, that they're going to find a way to, to take this loss against Orlando use it as a lesson, and be better on Saturday. And I think Donovan Mitchell even said it in his post-game remarks, said, this is black and white. We know all the things that we did wrong tonight against Orlando. Yes, you have to give the Magic credit for the way that they played, the adjustments that they made. They were smart. But, like, we just didn't bring it to the level that we need to bring it for playoff basketball. So now they've got to do that, right? That's what it comes down to, to me is can you show a level of maturity? Can you show a level of focus from the very beginning of the game? Can you play with the intensity that's required at the beginning of the game? And, and can you show that, yes, even though um, this was a terrible loss, even though this was an embarrassing loss, um, you're able to learn from it and you're able to be better moving forward um like one of the things that that i think people do still kind of like wonder about the Cavs is okay if they're considered a front-running team like how do they handle this kind of adversity 
Like the one adversity that we've seen them be able to handle is all of the absences within the roster. But like this kind of adversity, I think people have legitimate questions um, about how they're going to be able to respond to it. And now this is their opportunity. They say they're different. They say they're tougher. They say that they are mentally tougher as well, just like physically tougher. Um, this is their opportunity to show it, improve it. Can you just baseline? Can you play in one arena like you do in another? Again, I want to reiterate, like that is that is little kid stuff. For the, for the difference, like for for the difference to be so drastic from game from games one and two to game three, your defense is overwhelming, strangling. It doesn't look like the Orlando Magic will ever score one hundred points again <laughs> at the Rock, and then you go there. And they score, I think I looked, they had only scored like 120 points like 14 times all year. So this is like, this is like peak Orlando Magic offense. And I, there's a lot more that goes into it, but venue change. I think that's a lot of it. The, the, you know, Orlando had some more energy. Their role players were more comfortable. They, they played with more juice because they were at home. Just, just give me, can, can you give me consistency home and road? This, this is like kind of like... Yeah. You know, 101 level stuff if you want it for, for playoff teams. And I think it's a mentality thing. And we've said it all night long. One game doesn't define yeah. the series. It didn't define the series when it was game one or game two. But this one is different for the Cavs. It's a way that they have to respond afterwards. Go ahead, Chris. I want to point out a stat. Because I was looking this up in the in the media center at uh, Kia Center, so this was the worst playoff loss in franchise history. Um, the three <laughs> other ones before this were 2008, 2018, and 2016. The Cavs won all three of those series, so that doesn't mean that it's going to happen again the same kind of way. But it brings home the point that a terrible playoff loss is just that. It is a terrible playoff loss. And the Magic don't get bonus points. <laughs> this, this isn't a thing where they get bonus points because they walloped the Cavs. Game 4 is going to start 0-0. It's not going to start with the Magic up by 38 points. Um, it's going to start 0-0. And this is just... A thing that sometimes, as, as difficult as it is for people to understand, as difficult as it is for some people to accept, this is a thing that happens in the playoffs. It happens to teams that win championships. It happens to teams that flame out in the first round. It happens to teams that get to the conference finals. It's the playoffs. A couple of things Jim on that real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, does it give the Magic bonus points at tip? No. No. If the Magic go up 8 nothing, does 8 nothing feel like 14 nothing? Maybe. Maybe. Possibly. Like, that. there's a something there can be... Again, if we, if we accept the premise that the Cavs are a front-running team and they have something of a glass jaw, there can be, with some of those teams, like a, oh boy, here it comes... Like, that can infect your team and sure. when another team goes on a run. And I, I also I saw the, the, the stat about the Cavs losing bad playoff series. One, this obvious point to make, they had LeBron on those teams. Of course. So, you know, he has there's, – there's two things there. It's easier to come back from this when you have LeBron. There's just an, like, unshakable confidence that comes with having that, that guy on your team. There is also just an understand like – that goes both ways. There's a, it's easier to bounce back when you have a loss like that when you have LeBron on your team. It's also just it's easier for that to happen. I think sometimes like LeBron had a very unique uh, sense of when a playoff game was out of hand, right? And so sometimes he would just let the rope go. And I think his teammates recognized that, mm -hmm. and so these these losses meant less in the moment too right because like i guess what i'm trying these 
these these guys felt like those teams felt like they could let go of the rope because they're like we've been there done that this team has not been there or done anything so uh, i think it's a little different it, 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 people it's not just the lebron teams playoff teams have been losing ugly games for decades and winning series that's right i just think that when you're when it's with a team that has that is so as unproven as this team it's a little bit more concerning to me Chris, it looked like you had something to add there. Well, again, it's not it's it's not specifically that okay, the Cavs have shown in past playoff series when they get the doors blown off, like they find a way to rally. This is a different team, this is a different personnel. It's more of a broader point of one loss, no matter no matter what what the reason is for it, um, no matter what the margin is for it does not necessarily carry over. The Celtics won by 20 in Game 1. The Heat made the proper adjustments, and they were able to win Game 2 on the road. Yes, the Cavs are not the Heat. Yes, the Cavs do not have Eric Spolstra. But it's a broader point of these kinds of things happen in, in, in playoff series, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's predictive in either way. I mean, the Mavericks were down by 100 points, it seemed like, in the first half against the Clippers um, in Game 1, and they found a way, right? So the only thing that I keep going back to is that um, playoff series can get like this. Um, And just because one thing happens one game, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen for sure a next game. Just like with the Cavs' defense, right? Just because the Cavs' defense was great in the first two games in Cleveland against the Magic, and they exploited all of the flaws of the Magic, it didn't mean that it was going to be great in Game 3. And it most certainly wasn't great in Game 3. So these things are very, very... I guess the way that I would put it is they're not predictive. And every game in a playoff series takes on its new life. And now it's up to the Cavs and J.B. Bickerstaff... Um, to make the counters that they need to make, the adjustments that they need to make, so that it can have a different outcome. And and I think there are things that the Cavs can do at a much, much higher level. And I do think that there are strategic adjustments that they can make, especially if the Magic are going to put two on the ball when it comes to Donovan or Darius. Um, And I do think that at some point, shooting variance is probably going to go in the favor of the Cavs, because they aren't this level shooting team. They're just not. They didn't show that throughout the entire season. Their their individual shooters are much... Donovan Mitchell is better than one of six. Right? Darius Garland is better than one of four. Max Struess is better than 0 of four. So at some point, I do think, um, throughout this seven-game series, and maybe it happens Saturday, I think the variance, the shooting variance, is going to shift toward the Cavs. And I know unless you guys want to go into those little things that could be changed tonight, I think we can wrap up, but I have a first little fun thing because I know this has been a rather negative podcast <laughs> on the end of the cab. But, Chris, do you want to go into those little things that you mentioned that you think the Cavs could do better? No, I think we can hold those. I think that's fine. For sure. Okay, so as you said that someone in the Cavs locker room said that they're going back to Cleveland up 3-1. How do I put this? Do you think the Cavs are petty enough to pull up in all black fits for (laughs) game four and say it's like the Orlando Magic's funeral for the series, because if they go back to Cleveland, then they're going to wrap the series up on their own turf. Again, I know Chris is rolling his eyes. This is a fun thing. I just wanted to see what y'all would say, and I already knew what Chris's reaction was going to be. No, I don't think the Cavs collectively are going to show up and get caught up into that kind of nonsense and everybody wear black because it's a funeral. I might wear all black. But that's just because that's the outfit that I brought with me to Orlando. Black jeans, black hoodie. 
Um, Got to put some Air Force Ones with that, too, to get a pop of white. Um, but, but I will say this. I will say this. The Cavs, after the game, whether they wanted to admit it publicly or not, you could feel it, right? You could sense it from the team. They were not happy with how much uh, poop, let's say poop, <laughs> the, uh, the magic we're talking throughout the course of the game, right? Like they were acting like a team that was up 2-1 in the series, not a team that was trailing 2-1. And, again, the Cavs didn't do anything to change that. They didn't do anything to stop that. The Magic had a great night. They deserved to celebrate big plays. That's what's going to happen, right? But there was essentially a feeling of, y'all weren't talking when you were losing by 20 in Cleveland, right? Y'all weren't talking when you couldn't score 85 points in either one of those games. Y'all weren't talking when you were looking completely overmatched outclassed, out toughed, out anything that you want to say. So I do think that the, the, the magic gave the Cavs a little extra juice going into game four. The Cavs have to do something about it. They've got to use it the right kind of way. But there was a sense of, all right, y'all want to talk. Okay, that's fine. We're aware. We saw it. We heard it. Now we're going to do something about it. We'll see if they do, but that was the vibe that I got being in there. I'm wearing all black right now. Maybe it's the <laughs> maybe it's the uh, the death of Cavs optimism on the podcast. I don't know. Um, I, I would say this: I'm interested to see what like are we going to get a close game, and if so, how does that look? Because both right. these are two offenses that can get really stuck in the mud so i would i would be very curious to see how that looks big picture though man i mean like kind of again one game one game one game i got the so today was the first time I, in this series even beforehand we i think we all picked captain six where i got the vibes like could this be one of those like it's one of those seven game series where the game, none of the games are close right like it's just like an extreme swing from from home and road like could it could it be one of those series? I don't know, man. I, I've my confidence in the Cavs has been maybe I maybe I'm I, I I think it's clear that'd be a bad playoff player. I'm just living and dying here. I'm living and dying with every piece of new information that I get. Can but, I ask a question? Can I ask a question? I don't know. What's up? What's up? Did Did you see anything tonight out of this game that makes you change your feel on the Cavs' ability to win this playoff series? Not win. I just think it could be longer than I thought. Go seven instead of six. Like, I mean, because yeah. yeah. we so all that's, picked that's six. What I was saying. That, that thought we entered my head today. We all expected Orlando yeah. to do something in this series. Right. Correct. Right, but I was I was leading five after game one. Like I said, I, am, <laughs> I was about to say he was ready to change his pick. He was <laughs> ready the, to change his pick after game the, one. <laughs> put me on the bench. The lights are too bright for me. <laughs> Yo, Sam, uh, with all the drafting going on, don't let Jimmy near whatever you have going on. <laughs> I'm, an eight, I'm an 82 game player, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> all right, now. Chris, Jimmy, anything else before we wrap up today's podcast? No, I don't think so. I, I think we hit on the key points. Again, the only thing that, that stood out to me is that every perceived weakness that the Cavs have um, showed up tonight. And I just, I cannot imagine a situation, and I could be wrong. <laughs> Maybe they're going to show up Saturday and be even worse. But I just can't imagine a situation where they play worse than they did tonight. This was as bad as the Cavs could play at both ends of the floor. And for them to get physically dominated on the glass... I can't imagine that that continues again. Maybe I have too much faith in this team. Maybe I have too much belief in this team. Maybe like the players who are feeling pretty confident even after a 38-point beatdown, maybe I just have too much faith. Um, but but I just can't see them playing actually this bad two games in a row. Yeah. I think I agree with that. I did think of a of a of something I saw tonight that 
that gave me some doubt that that Orlando could win the series. Paolo was the best player on the floor. Yeah, like, by by One a Grand game. Canyon sized margin. One sure. game yep. tonight. I, I've tonight. said it a lot. I'm trying to I'm trying to remind myself even when I say this. One yes. game. <laughs> One game. But if that is if that is repeatable, that would make me nervous. I mean, we touched on it. Depending on how Donovan Mitchell's knee feels, depending on whether Darius Garland wants to show his face in this series. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like we've said all night, it's just one game. We can't overreact or overanalyze as the Cavs still hold a 2-1 to one series lead. And we're after losing by the worst margin of deficit, <laughs> by the worst margin in franchise history, mm. we're only up from here. So... You say that, and they're going to find <laughs> a way to go Until next time. <laughs> well, I hope that's not the case for, for what I it's just like the, said. That's but like the podcast. Until please. next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, until next time, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. This is where you can get insider analysis on the games as the game is happening or just join the Cavs community and conversate with me and Chris or just scream at how bad the Cavs are playing depending on how the series goes. But to do that, you need to sign up for a 14-day free trial or... Visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.